So now it's my privilege to introduce Kelly Michelson. Kelly Michelson is the Julia and David Uline Professor of Bioethics and Medical Humanities at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and the Director of the Center for Bioethics and Medical Humanities. She's an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Northwestern and an attending physician in the Division of Pediatric Critical Care at Lurie Children's Hospital, as well as the Director of the Institute for Public Health and Medicine. Kelly completed her ethics fellowship here at the McLean Center in 2010, and today Kelly will give a talk entitled Bioethics Education in the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, Beyond End-of-Life Care Decision-Making. Please join me in welcoming Kelly. Thanks, uh, Lainey. It's really great to be here. I haven't uh, been down to U of C very much, and I always love coming back, so thank you for the invitation. It's a thrill for me. So um, just uh, to let you know about some grant funding that I have from PCORI and ACS and uh, some other places, but no other conflicts. So my uh, goals for today are to um, describe some of the ethical issues that we encounter in the PICU. I'm not going to talk about slow codes. Uh, and then to describe at least two different approaches to teaching bioethics to clinicians who practice in the PICU. Um, so this uh, came about because when I was a fellow in the PICU, we uh, were fortunate, very fortunate to have month, uh, monthly ethics discussions, a full hour dedicated to bioethics in the PICU, which I think is unique and uh, I, was, I was grateful for it. But I was also frustrated because they were sort of structured like we'd all sit down, someone would identify a case that was happening and we'd kind of talk about it. And while it was good and important, um, I also found sort of uh, a, a sense of like I wish I had a little bit more a little bit more structure and the cases often ended up being sort of similar cases because we do see uh, issues where we talk about DNR and does it make sense and it kind of these end of life care things kept coming up but what else was there so when I took a position as an attending I took over these discussions and um, had to think about what I wanted them to look like um, and when I was thinking about it, um, there were sort of certain things that I wanted to make sure that they that came across. And these were mostly directed towards fellows, but attendings would come. And as the day, as um, as I continued to do this over the years, invited more and more people uh, in the PICU, nurses, social workers, et cetera. So wanted to make sure to cover sort of fundamentals, what I call Bioethics 101 on speed, some bread and butter topics, things that we see commonly in the PICU, talk about new things that are happening in bioethics, and then sort of more the human side of things. You know what, these are an old set of slides. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I'm just going to keep talking. Do you want to continue? No. Sure. Um, so, um, the kind of what to teach I've sort of gone through, and the the other thing was sort of how to teach them. And um, I wanted also to have sort of a mix of this. So we did kind of a combination of case-based uh, case based discussions and then we have included sort of what I call like piggybacking on other things happening we've invited people in to give uh, to present with us and then um, also sort of the listen read sit and think so trying to focus on the human side so what I'm uh, I have a beautiful picture to show you of a quilt that my mother made. <laughs> uh, my point in showing you this beautiful picture is that um, I kind of think of this kind of approach like the quilt. Quilts are, this quilt is made of like all these different scraps of material that have been sitting around that are part of a bigger, more beautiful, you know, bigger piece that was created for a, a different space. And when they come together, they form a picture um, made of all these different scraps. And I think that's kind of what our bioethics um, curriculum looks like over a couple of years, people sort of get a flavor for each of these different scraps and my hope is that in the end they'll sort of come away with some sense of what it's all about. Um, so this is the beautiful quilt. 
thanks to my mom, and thank you for the <laughs> for changing those. Um, so I kind of already did this. I'm not going to go back and do it. Um, so what I thought I'd do is kind of just give you a sense of the things that we go over and how we do it. Um, and then uh, if we have time, when do I finish? Oh, nice. Okay, great. Uh, I, I will do something else. Okay, so in terms of sort of general fundamentals, right, I wanted the fellows to come away with all these terms so that when they move on in their careers, they can talk about what principles are, consequentialism, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this, this, these ideas usually fit quite well in sort of this case-based approach. We had a nine-year-old patient with a brain tumor who was unresponsive uh, the brain tumor was unresponsive to treatment um, and had become neurologically devastated but didn't meet brain death criteria and the mother was very adamant that we continue to do everything that we could possibly do um, and this met with a lot of challenge in our unit. So what we did for this particular case was we went through it with the eyes of the lens of what would sort of a principalist approach take, how would a consequentialist look at this, et cetera, et cetera. So people get um, some exposure. Um, decision making is a big part of the ICU and there are sort of again some fundamental terms that I wanted all the fellows to have. So for this we um, used a case of a 16 year old with uh, chronic granulomatous disease who was admitted with uh, sepsis and kidney failure um, but was refusing care but also wanted to be a full code. And so this gave us an opportunity to um, think about each of these different things. And fortunately or unfortunately, these kinds of cases come up in the PICU with such regularity that we can, we can, we can take usually um, a, a case that's happening at, the, at that time. Um, in terms of some of the bread and butter topics, transplantation is a big one. Um, at my institution, we do all transplants except for lung transplants, um, and they bring up a lot of topics. Um, donation after circulatory death, which has been, uh, you know, something that's developed during the course of my lifetime. Um, we had a case of a 12-year-old who was brain dead after a suicide um, that gave us an opportunity to talk to Oh, well, that's actually not a good case for that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, decisions about listing patients for transplantation, a teenager with an intentional overdose who was in acute liver failure, neurologically devastated patient who was in acute liver failure, and transplantation from a non-U.S. citizen. So again, as these cases come up, an opportunity to talk about transplantation. Um, the other cases that I um, talk about are sort of other issues that come up in the course of working in the intensive care unit. And this gives us an opportunity to talk about research ethics. So um, for example, authorship. As someone who do does research and mentors young trainees, um, this comes up every year and how do you think about authorship and what are the ethical issues around authorship? Um, not something that is necessarily specific to the ICU but that's very important. Some of the other things that have come up in our unit are issues related to conflicting research studies. We do a lot of multi-center research as well as um, investigator initiated research and sometimes we have the problem where the same patient qualifies for two different studies and um, investigators are both interested in enrolling that patient or family and how do you decide how to approach that person, who approaches the person, whether they are, uh, the family learns about all the studies or one after the other. So there's a lot of ethical issues that have come up just because of the research that we do. Um, and then we were also involved in a study, another multi-site study, looking at um, management of patients who have had CPR and families needed to be consented within six hours. So this brought up issues around obtaining emergency consent. What are the challenges um, of, containing, of obtaining consent in a highly stressful, emotionally charged situation? 
So when I started doing this, it was uh, about once a month, and I did kind of all of them, which is really boring because that's the same person. <laughs> kind of, I've been fortunate over the last couple of years to have a couple of colleagues join me, but I still think that it's really important to bring in other perspectives. So one of the things that we've done over the last few years is bring in other speakers to give us their view on things. So we've had nurse bedside pick you bedside nurses come and present. They talked about a patient um, who we were doing a compassionate extubation on and what it's like from their perspective to provide the sedation for that patient. Um, they talked about caring for a brain dead child for long extended periods of time and what that uh, what the issues are for them. And then we brought in a, um, some parents. We had a father of a child with spinal muscular atrophy who came in and helped us think about um, decision making um, and some of the challenges that, that he experienced uh, with his child and for other children with chronic medical, complicated medical conditions. So then there's the piggyback approach. So one of the challenges is if you plan these sessions based on cases that are happening in the ICU, there's not always the case that's going to fit what you want when you want. So that can be a little bit of a challenge. But there's oftentimes things happening in outside the world that that we've piggybacked on, so as sort of not to reinvent the wheel and keep people current and relevant. As an example, the Society of Critical Care Medicine put out a webinar around palliative sedation. It was an interview it with discussions, provided us an opportunity to think about the ethical challenges in this area and talk about things like the doctrine of double effect. Um, and then when the uh, a policy statement about requests for potentially inappropriate treatments in ICU came out. That was another opportunity for us to think about how other f others feel, what the thoughts are in this area, and help keep everyone relevant and timely. Some of the things that we've done have been a little bit more didactical, more didactic in nature. One of the people who's joined in the last couple of years, Erin Paquette, is a lawyer, so she gives a talk usually once, once a year or once every other year um, around legal issues in Illinois, things that we as ICU doctors need to know, things like protective custody, EMTALA, compassionate use of therapeutics. Um, someone's given a talk on health disparities and justice. And then, again, I, I, uh, trying to help keep this relevant to everyone, um, touching on topics that are really timely. So when um, the country was dealing with issues around Ebola and how to manage Ebola, we were a site for people with uh, suspected Ebola. And that brought on a number of challenges, including who um, who takes care of those patients, what we do if they were to arrest, and how all that happens. So a lot of issues around professional regulation, ob obligation. Um, the so social media has become an interesting challenge for a lot of us in medicine, and so gave us an opportunity to talk about personal and professional boundaries and HIPAA. And then we usually once a year or every other year do sort of a stories in the media session where we talk about what everybody else is talking about. And here the Jahai McMath case is an example of um, one of the things that we would bring up. So then the last thing is what I call read, listen, write, sit. Um, usually once a year we do I usually call it a narrative ethics, and the idea is to kind of focus a little bit more on the human side of things. Um, I think I have to thank John Lantos for this, because I think this was really sort of Im embedded in my head when I did the fellowship here. And um, I usually do this in February or March, because it's cold, it's dark, people are really tired in the PICU, it's been a long winter season, and I feel like they need an opportunity to not think about terms, and uh, but to just think about where the humanity lies in the work that we do. So to give you an idea of the kinds of things that we've done, um, I've, I've had people read this piece that was uh, 
published in the New Yorker a few years ago called The Aquarium. This was written by a father of a child who, at around seven or eight months of age, developed a brain tumor and talks about his experience from the diagnosis to the death of his child. He describes this experience as sort of living in an aquarium and sort of realizing there's a world out there. It turns out this father's uh, daughter was taken care of at Children's Memorial, so it really is very um, uh, poignant for us. But not all the pieces, obviously, are that close to home. Uh, the JAMA, A Piece of My Mind, is a great resource for the, this kind of work. One of the things that we've read is this piece called A Panda Story, which um, focuses on how we as healthcare providers have touched the people that we care for in a meaningful way, sometimes in ways that we don't always appreciate at the time. And then um, another one, the view from Fiesol, Fiesole. Are there Italians in here? I was with an Italian last night. To, Fiesole, I think is how you pronounce that. Fiesole is a... Um, is a small town right near Florence that I've never been to, but maybe someday I'll be fortunate to, that supposedly has this incredibly beautiful, picturesque view, amazing. Um, it's so, people, so many people who go to Italy go to Florence and never see Fiesole. And the idea is that, um, that, that this piece talks about is that as we go through our lives in healthcare and we sort of touch on the surface that it, in sort of with all the challenges happening with healthcare, time constraints, financial constraints, um, we're losing a lot of the soul of what we do in medicine. But if we take the time to dig a little bit deeper, uh, there's a lot more to be seen, a lot more substance that can help guide what we do and um, sort of help nurture that soul. So I was going to take one or two more minutes to give you all an example of that uh, because this is going to be a long day and people are going to be sitting. So I thought maybe a little bit of a change of pace even though we're at the beginning. So I'm going to read to you all this book called Lulu's Rose Colored Glasses, which as you can see, has a little bit of rose-colored glasses. I would show you the pictures, but I don't think that's going to work well. So here we go. Um, Lulu's in the back. That's me in the front. We're driving to Chromeset's house when I said with a grunt. What a horrible, rotten, gray day. The sky is gray. The trees are gray. The road is gray. Even the leaves are gray. Oh, I guess we're out of luck for the day. Come to think of it, Lulu, I feel gray. I really don't like to feel this way. Lulu wasn't listening to me when she said, Oh, Mama, look what I found. It's my rose-colored glasses. They're rosy and round. Oh, Mama, try them on and see. Please try them on and see what I can see. Lulu, please, I'm trying to drive. I really need to have quiet for heaven's sakes alive. Oh, Mama, oh, Mama, would you please try them on? I looked at her face and she had a little grin. Didn't she know the mood I was in? Lulu, listen, we're almost home. Would you please be quiet and leave me alone? I looked at her sweet face and then gone was her wonderful, magical grin. Okay, Lulu, I'll try them on. I said rather sad, wondering why in the world I had gotten so mad. So on went the darn glasses, so rosy on my face, and in spite of myself, the world seemed a more beautiful place. Gone was the gray that made me so glum, everything was pink and rosy and plum. Oh, Lulu, the sky is rosy and the trees are rosy, the road is rosy, even the leaves are rosy. Lulu, everything is so beautiful and rosy. Well, I guess we're not out of luck for the day. Boy, do I love to feel this way. Oh, Lulu, thank you for making me see what you see. I'm so glad to have you here with me. You brighten my days when the world seems gray. You show me the world in a brand new way. By the way, Lulu, can I have your rose-colored glasses? No, Mama, you need to find your own. And that's just what I did. 
I feel like um, it's important to remember that everybody sees things from a different vantage point, and um, that's sort of, I think, one of the points of that story. So um, with that, I will stop. Thank you. Quick question for you, in terms of logistics of teaching this, um, a lot of medical education these days requires um, documentation and milestones and um, all sorts of administrative hassle. How do you fit this into that? Yeah, I, I've been fortunate not to have to deal with that. Um, <laughs> so to, be, to be quite honest, um, although I mean, I think that's manageable. We could certainly do that. Um, the way the curriculum and the PICU, PICU is set up where I work, um, they have, you know, an established curriculum and ethics fits into that. It's part of the AAMC, right. whatever, requirements and stuff. So there's a strong support for it, and nobody has yet made me come up with milestones, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So I guess I've dodged that bullet. 